All right, Packet people, as you know, DNS has been in the news quite a bit lately, especially with some very large scale outages that we've seen with major services. So I thought we would take a few minutes here on the channel to break down DNS and get an idea of how it works. So in this video, we're gonna talk about why we need DNS, the state of DNS today, generally how DNS is structured, and we're gonna take a look at a client doing a request and resolving an address. So first, let's start off with why we need DNS. Well, a lot of applications that you use these days use domain names to identify services. Think about yourself. When you open up a web browser, you don't type in an IP address. Usually you type in a domain name. But your machine can't go and send a TCP connection to that domain name. It first has to resolve that domain name to an address. Then your machine can go connect. Now, whether that address is an IPv4 address or IPv6 address, all of that is a part of the query that you'll resolve. Now this is where your machine is configured for a DNS server. A lot of times you get that from your DHCP configuration or it can even be manually configured. Now for most of our local systems, what we are pointing to is called a DNS resolver. Now that IP address might be your local gateway and that's just forwarding DNS queries out to its resolver or it could be an IP address that your ISP gave you. They could have said, use these DNS resolvers and we'll take care of DNS for you. Now that's a very important machine to know about. If you think about it, you're asking this server for anything that you might be requesting. It could be wireshark.org, packetpioneer.com, cisco.com, whatever it is, YouTube. It's gonna have to resolve all of those names to IP addresses. But there's no one place on the internet, there's no one server that is fully aware of all names and all IP addresses all at the same time. I mean, think about the number of names and addresses that it would need to track. It would be very easy for that system to become bogged down and it certainly would be difficult to keep it up to date. So for that reason, DNS works as a hierarchy. There's different steps that DNS goes through to fully resolve a name to an IP address. Now going through those steps, we're going to deal with that on the next video. We're gonna take a closer look at how that all works. But for now on this video, I just wanna show you how to generate some DNS traffic to your local resolver. And we're gonna take a look at the response and how that looks. So we're gonna take a look at the timing, we're gonna look at the protocols that it uses, and we're gonna break down the DNS header and get that closer look. So let's do it. So you know me, the first thing I'm gonna do always is just fire up Wireshark and I'm also going to fire up a terminal just next to it. I'd like you to follow along with me and you can capture this locally for yourself as well. Okay, so on the left, this is what we're gonna do. I'm just gonna get this ready. And to do a manual lookup, I can just do NS lookup and that's a utility that will just manually generate a DNS request for me. And I'm just gonna look up wireshark.org, okay? Just gonna let that sit over there for a moment few other parameters that we can use, but let's park it there for right now. Uh, over here on the right, I already have a filter, a display filter set for DNS. That's what I want to filter for, at least on my display. And I'm going to, notice I'm not doing it in capture filter. I'm just going to do it in display filter. And I'm going to come down here and start that capture. All right, so let's go ahead and hit Wireshark. So now I've got some packets coming in and I'm going to go ahead and share this with you and you can follow me along with me as we take a closer look. All right, packet people, so let's just take a look at what happened with this very simple DNS resolution. All right, you got four packets here. Uh, the first one, you can see that wireshark.org, we're going out and we're looking for an A record. Now, what that means is what we want an IPv4 address for wireshark.org. If we were looking for an IPv6 address, what you would see here as far as the type that we would be looking for, it would be four A's, A-A-A-A. That would mean, hey, I don't want V4, I want a V6 address. So for here, our requester is looking for a V4 address. So we see that's the type A record that we're given. Also class, just real quick on what that is. Basically, this means an internet address. Uh, historically with DNS, there's a lot of other types of queries that could have been used. Some you're still gonna see today, but generally if it's an internet address, that's gonna, gonna be what you see there in IN. Now I'm going to come up from this just a moment. Now notice DNS is using UDP port 53, and then we see the DNS stuff that is in that, that datagram, that payload. Now over here in the clear text view, this is one uh, concern that we have with DNS these days is that you can actually see the clear text of the requests that I'm sending out there from the wire, uh, wireshark.org. This is very passively observable. So if I was just listening to you 
uh, send out all your DNS stuff, I could see where you're going, see all the different domains that you're resolving, even stuff that you might not even be aware that you're resolving. So I'm just going to park that for later. That's one concern about DNS these days. Now, another thing, if I just collapse UDP, open up DNS, here we've got a transaction ID, so 499E. Now the response is going to share that transaction ID. My requester is saying, here's the request, here's an ID for it. The response comes back, and here I've got my transaction ID again. Now those th things need to match in order for my system to accept this as a DNS response. So it's got to come back to the right port, but it also has to have that same transaction ID. If something goes wonky with this, if it comes back with a different transaction ID, then I won't accept it. I'm going to say, hey, I don't know what that is. But think about that. That's super easy to hijack, spoof, redirect. How can I validate where this came from and if this really is what I was looking to do? That's another concern with DNS as it sits today as you are seeing it right so just this request response with no validation and also all this running in clear text those are some concerns so our query and let me go back up there again i'm just going to expand flags we're just going to focus on this just two of them so first this message is a query that indicates that my requester is asking for something and recursion is desired basically i'm saying hey resolver server if you don't know the answer to this could you go look for it could you go resolve this for me and go find that answer? Now, before I ever sent this packet, one thing that my machine did, this in this case, I manually generated a DNS request. But when you're usually using a system, it's first going to look at its DNS cache. That's going to be the first place it looks. Like, hey, have I resolved this before and has this uh, response timed out yet? It doesn't want to generate DNS traffic unless it needs to. So that's the first thing that it'll look for is that cache. And if we have it in recent history, I'll use and trust that. And if it hasn't timed out yet. But assuming that I haven't looked for this DNS request or this domain, or if this cache is old, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to generate all of this to get a fresh lookup. All right, so looking at this request, if I take a look at the question that I have within this, and if I go to queries, here I've got Wireshark.org. I'm looking for Wireshark.org is the name. The uh, host address or the, the uh, type is an A. And then internet is the class. All right, if I take a look at the response, there's my transaction ID. Just going to peek at the flags here. So this is a response. Recursion was available. No errors. Thumbs up. And in the response, DNS will also let me know what the query was. Here's the query that you were looking for. Wireshark.org. Yeah, you wanted a type A, so you wanted an IPv4 address, internet address, and here's your answer. Now, in this response, I had three answers. That's totally legit legitimate. DNS can provide me with more than one. What if the first one didn't work? Uh, and I could default or I could roll to the next one. Uh, so here's the first address you could try, and you can store this in your cache for five minutes. Here's the address. Uh, here's another one. Again, five minutes. Here's another one. Again, five minutes. So since systems, especially services, can be so dynamic, especially these larger systems that we're interacting with today, uh, you don't want to store a DNS query for too long. Uh, these things can refresh, they can move, they can change, they can be redistributed, they can go to different uh, carrier networks. Uh, so what this does, by not sticking that DNS record in your DNS cache for too long, it's going to keep it fresh and up to date with what the latest address that you should go to is. All right, so that's the high level on how DNS works. But what we want to know now, though, is how does that resolver work on the back end? How does it actually resolve that address? What goes on at that next level? Also, what does the future hold as far as securing and encrypting DNS? Let's go ahead and save that for our next video in the series. Come on back, pack of people, and I'll see you next time.